Hey fan, it's me Aaron. And I am the friend who draws things, Tony. And this is Comic Show. We've been having a lot of fun with stuff on Bleeding Cool. I had a lot of stories up, stories that I, you know, gave information to or stories mm -hmm. that I just like had fun being sarcastic about, like the cat getting punched in the face. I mean, seriously, first you have gay superheroes and then you have gay superheroes abusing animals. I mean, that was what Red Lantern was. It's a slippery was. slope. Uh, it is. And Fox you know, News was right. Then you had the, the gay bullet train, you know, mm -hmm. it's the new women refrigerators is gays on bullet trains. <laughs> and uh, it was just a good week for, you know, bad puns. Yes. You know, like, I mean, seriously, the reason I love gays is because gays have more puns. I mean, Absolutely. honestly, that's my secret origin. Ow. So. Anyway, uh, also we've been on there with Nerdy Show. Nerdy yeah. Show is doing all the E3 coverage on Bleeding Cool because Bleeding Cool got them into E3. Kind of. And uh, no, they. It, no, yeah. I know. <laughs> so uh, it's a lot of good. They have all the video game coverage, all of it on their site. But what's going on Bleeding Cool is the things relevant to your interests, which are comic books related, like Young Justice, where they're going through the game that takes place in that five-year gap between seasons one and two. And I wasn't even like, oh, it's a game, cool. But then that's the storyline, the canon storyline between. Season one, season two, I'm there. That's awesome to Tagline, me. Tagline, one will rise, one will fall, one will die. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah, you yeah. know who doesn't die because you know who's around in season two. A little bit. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a, a list of people who don't. And uh, Bleeding Cool Rich put on the Before Comics video I did where I explained that comics kept me alive in my, um, you know, my cutting phase. Mm -hmm. And also uh, got me laid. Same man yeah. got me laid. That's a fact, you know. Like, I can, I can produce the woman if, if we... Need, uh, I'm sure she'll back me up on that. But um, before comics is our thing for before Watchmen, so you can do a video, say what your life was like before comics, which I did an example of. And it's kind of like it gets better of. for geeks. Yes, it gets better for geeks. It does. It really does. And uh, Minutemen, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I liked revisiting that universe, those characters. It's very nostalgic, and I love Darwin Cook. He kept really well to the spirit of the original characters. He captured each of them, even in like the three and, pages. And I did like each. how it was like under the hood. It felt yeah. like under the hood. Even the narration that wasn't under the hood, I, I enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm down for that. And here's my thing, and this is what Darwin Cook told me. He said, doing this is going to introduce new people to the source material the same way that his spirit introduced people to Will Eisner's spirit, mm -hmm. and the same way that his Parker stuff introduced people to the Parker novels. I sold 12 copies of this last week. You mean there's proof that introducing new things stimulates interest in the old? Well, everyone thinks everyone's read that because yes. everyone's narcissistic and self-absorbed mm -hmm. in our society. I was until my friend died. But um, <laughs> then I had this real, <laughs> I realized I'm not alone in the universe, you know, that other people's opinions matter somewhat. And um, so this was introduced to 12 new people mm -hmm. in my store last week, and I'm glad they did. It's a win for everyone. And, you know, awesome. And this week you have more Darwin Cook writing this, but the big story with the Silk Spectre is Amanda Connor's art. I mean, so good. It's very expressive, and it really captures, like, the insecurity of adolescence of a, a female growing up and all that stuff and, you know, living up to expectations of her mother and expectations of society and whatnot, and especially because it's basically the... Black Canary story of the Golden Age Black Canary and, you know, Dinah Lance, and, but through uh, the lens of uh, Phantom Lady, through the lens of Alan Moore Silk Spectre. Yep. So there's a lot of lenses here, but... <laughs> it, it, All the, of them are great art on the other side. Yes, the pictures are great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you want to pass it up, pass it up, but here Why in my house... Why would you deprive yourself? Deprive we you love it. it. Yeah. All right, this... All these Robins, oh my God. War of the Robins, this just, you know... Uh, how can you look at this cover and not want to get inside of those mm. Robins? But uh, mm. Batman tins out, and you know I like the Night of the Owls. It was fun. It was it's fast paced, but mm -hmm. you know then the sun came up and nothing was really resolved. This issue resolves so much. It's the penultimate issue of the entire Court of Owls super arc. A good old WTF reveal. It's the reveal of who's behind all the talons in the Court of Owls. Who's behind everything? Who set them up? Who was the secret player behind everything that? I can't, like, if I said who it was, everyone would hate me. The people in this room would hate me. The dude listing my variant covers on eBay already warned me that he will, because I ruined something for him with issue nine. But seriously, this issue is full of payoff, and it is freaking awesome. Uh, Scott Ooh. Snyder, thank you so much. This is so good. Um, Bendis rocked with the Spider-Man. Yes, uh, he did. Oh, my goodness, yes. He's great at dialogue. He was great at writing Peter Parker, Ultimate Peter Parker. He's done some good stuff with uh, Peter and the New Avengers. Mm -hmm. But this was a full issue of Peter just being, being hilarious Peter. and uh, fighting with Mysterio. Yep. And uh, that ends up getting him in the Ultimate Universe. Uh -oh. And then he's in the Ultimate Universe in this costume. And 
Even Everybody knows that Spider-Man is Peter, Peter Parker. Parker and he doesn't ben. know how to cope with this. And then you have, you know, the, the meet-up with this, with the, the two guys. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is so exposing, you know. It's yeah, they're so, exposing each other to yes. themselves. So, I'm really digging it. And I know that they said they would never do a crossover with Ultimate Universe and the regular universe. But that was when it wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. Now it makes total sense because there's a story to be told with Miles Morales and Peter Parker. There's a unique story to be told. A young Peter Parker... And then old Peter Parker is just like, eh, this, there's a story to be told, you know? Like, so, anyway. Parker gets to be Uncle Ben. Yes. And not the popcorn guy. Come on, man. All right, so versus three, I enjoyed it more than uh, A vs. X5. A vs. X5 was all right, and mm -hmm. it was very plot-driven. It was like A, B, C, Phoenix Force now, blah, blah, blah. That's why my, my review was things happen. Yes. Things happen that I couldn't spoil. And that was about it. Yes. I read issue six by Hickman on the retailer site, and it is phenomenal. It's like the authority, man. I loved issue six. Yes. But issue five, eh. And here's the uh, fight scenes, the extended fight scenes from issue five, which I thoroughly enjoyed. This it's, was fun. It's stupid fun. It's the Rasputins versus other people, and somebody yes. finally learned how to draw a Colossonaut. Well, you know, it's McGinnis, who's good at doing, like, big He basically guys. draws, he has um, his He-Man figures, <laughs> and that's the base for how he draws everyone, is the big... He-Man bubbly muscles. Everything makes so much yes. sense now. So, anyway, you get to see Black Widow and her inner demons go to fighting a real demon mm -hmm. in Limbo, and it's awesome. So, it's so good. This is fun. It's fun. Uh, you can not get it if you don't want to, but I enjoyed it. I think I think it was fun. It was more fun than A vs. X5. Yes. So, and on Candy X-Force 26, this book is almost bittersweet to me now because it's so on fire and it's so much feeling like... This is the end. Like, I haven't talked to Rick Remender about it, but it feels like he's wrapping up everything. That this is like the end cap to his whole super story, his whole dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's dynamic character arcs has been, have been pretty much fulfilled. And uh, now it's, instead of them being proactive going after the mutant killers to kill the mutant killers, the mutant killers have launched a sneak attack on them and are <laughs> after them because they have fallen apart from inside. It just feels like it's going to be over too soon, and I'm getting really, ah... Uh, but it's I gotta wonderful. comfort him nightly, it's sad. And you know, you got Noto on art, who, yeah. who doesn't want Noto on art? And lastly, the indie book of the week is The Massive by Brian Wood, which you might have read about if you got Bleeding Cool and read these, the article in here. I actually read this in PDF form because Brian Wood sent it to me ahead of time before the final order cut off because it's like insider trading with stocks except legal, I guess. Okay. So um, I read it and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think if you've liked anything Brian Wood has done, you would love this. It's the same type of themes of the whole political stuff and the whole like post-apocalyptic or society falling apart or even like tearing down society like his Channel Zero was. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot like DMZ where DMZ was 9-11 keeps happening, uh, red state versus blue state, Manhattan was a demilitarized zone mm -hmm. and you know, it's political urban. This is political non-urban. It's basically Greenpeace. I mean, come on. They're big boats, they go around, they're pacifists and they save whales. It's Greenpeace, but he can't call it Greenpeace. And then this environmental apocalypse. Every apocalypse happens that could happen. Everything, yes. The world's on fire, all right? <laughs> Society crumbles, and they realize that their pacifism is set up on the civility of mankind. It's set up on the rule of law, that they could be pacifists within the law. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, the Armageddon happens. Got to deal with the pirates of the Armageddon. Yes, there's pirates. And, <laughs> and, and I really dug it. And if you're a fan of Brian Wood's work, you will love this because it's similar yet different. So it has his DNA, but it's... I mean, being on a freaking boat is way different than being in New York City. I'm sorry. But it still has those say. heavy political overtones and the, uh, you know, where you would be if society crumbled around you. Mm -hmm. Who would you be and your own... You know, it's, it's heavy, dude. It's good stuff. The massive is great. And uh, that's what we have for today. Mm -hmm. uh, share our video if you're a fan of ours on Facebook. Share the video and uh, get it around. Share the love. And we will give you prizes. I'll give you one of everything on this table. Woo! Including a, a Watchmen graphic novel. So um, that's about it. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. See you. Thanks for watching the video and subscribe if you want to because that makes me happy. And when I said share the video, we're going to have it on Facebook like we do every week. Facebook.com slash shop and um, share it. Just click share. We'll see everyone that shares it and we'll randomly pick one person and give them all the books we talked about. So one person that shares it will win it all and doesn't matter where they live, we'll mail it to them um, or they can come pick it up in the store. So please share a video. It's fun. We'll try to get better. Thanks. Bye-bye.